Welcome, everyone, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, we are going to be joined by outdoorsman, professor, and journalist Lou Urenic, who is here to discuss his critically acclaimed memoir, Batcast, Fatherhood, Fly Fishing, and a River Journey Through the Heart of Alaska. And this is breaking news. It was just announced he won the National Outdoor Book Award. So congratulations. All right, so in the wilds of Alaska, on a father-son fishing trip, Louis Urenik's remarkable and unflinching, unflinchingly honest tale unfolds. Struggling to reconnect with his son after a divorce, Urenik takes him on a trip that becomes both an adventure story and a reconciliation story. The dangers of nature, bears, fast-moving currents, and punishing weather conditions are encountered as often as the hurts and emotional wounds of a divorce and a son's withheld love. Backcast has met with acclaim from many, many editors, authors, and book reviews, from big names to small, and like the Keen Sentinel praises, it is Huckleberry Finn written by Charles Dickens, a story of self-preservation told without bathos. There are two adventures here, each in its own wilderness and each with its own measure of indecision, difficulty, discovery, and serendipity. Louis Urenic is, a chairman of the Boston, is the chairman of the Boston University Journalism Department. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and Field and Stream. He was an editor at residence at the Neiman Foundation at Harvard and the page one editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Ladies and gentlemen, Lou Urenic. Thanks for that great introduction, and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, Backcast is, is a story of two journeys. Uh, the first uh, journey is, this, is a, a trip that my son and I took down a wilderness river in Alaska in the year 2000, the summer he had graduated from high school. And it was a fraught journey. Uh, first, it was very dangerous. Uh, the river had its dangers, the bears, uh, the speed of the water, um, sticks sticking up through the current that could puncture the raft and we actually had the ability to get lost on the river. How you wonder can somebody get lost on a river? You know it flows to the ocean. Well the rivers in Alaska braid as you get closer to the coast they spread out into deltas, deltas that regather back into the main stream of the river so it resembles a kind of aneurysm and uh, these braids have scores of channels some of which don't return back to the main stem of the river. So we actually spent a night lost on the river as well. So the first journey is uh, a description of Adam and me in the raft. Adam did not want to be on this trip, by the way. Um, I had twisted his arm to make the trip. I had raised Adam as a single father through high school, and um, it was an emotionally packed period in our life. Uh, he was uh, angry over a divorce. He uh, had chosen to live with me, so we were very close as father and son. Uh, I think the choice demonstrates that, but still he was very disappointed in the way things had worked out in our family, and he directed his anger toward me. And my hope was that by taking this trip to Alaska, I could settle some of the problems between us. Um, and uh, to some extent we did. I won't give away the end of the story. So that's the first the first journey in the trip, and I'm going to read a passage from the book that, um, that describes uh, that in particular. Um, the second journey in the book is, is more complicated and I think gives the book its resonance, and it was the surprise to me in the writing of the book. I didn't set out initially to write a memoir that all, went all the way back deep into my life, into my childhood. But as I wrote the book, I, found, I felt it kind of an undertow. You know, there was a an urge somehow on the, in the part of the narrative itself to pull me backward and to tell the story of my childhood, which somewhat ironically, I had grown up without a father, uh, raised by a single mother and um, lots of love for sure, uh, but it was a very chaotic and um, uh, somewhat difficult childhood in terms of um, resources, let's put it that way. We, it was a family that was moving around all the time. and and. Um, the way I coped with my childhood uh, was to go fishing, to go outdoors. And I found that in nature I found not only solace and peace and, and acceptance, but I also found a way to engage the world, to organize my thinking, and to sort of uh, have a, a, a deeper sense of myself. So the second journey really is a story of a boy growing up and using fishing to kind of become himself and become the man um, that he is. 
So let me begin by uh, opening, uh, re reading the opening, which more or less sets the scene. The book opens uh, on the third day of the trip. It rained every single day of the trip. <laughs> and um, I had picked the first week in Alaska, to first couple of weeks in Alaska to make this trip, which faded it to be wet the whole time. July is the time to travel in Alaska, I learned. So we had rain and snow. But the third day in particular had very bad weather. Inside the small circle of our tent, I listened to the rain that had blown in from the Bering Sea and the whisper of my son's breathing as he slept beside me. We were camped on a gravel bar that shouldered the Connecticut River on the western face of Alaska. The storm that was lashing our tent had begun as a typhoon northeast of Japan rolled across the North Pacific and shimmied up the chain of Aleutian Islands to the great Kuskokwim River Delta, where it was sputtering in a rattle of wind and rain. Our two-man tent billowed and snapped as if it were a luffing sail. We were more than 100 miles from the nearest link to the outside world, and that was a dirt landing strip at Quinnahuk, a Yupik Eskimo village. We were without a phone or radio, without a guide, and without the slightest bit of first-hand knowledge of the country we were in. This is where my memory of our trip usually begins, on the morning of the third day when the rain came down in sheets. Maybe that's because there was another storm blowing, the one between Adam and me. Memory is like that. It has its own intelligence. It holds on to what matters, and it sees connections between events in our lives that we sometimes miss when we are living them. My memory has put these two storms together, both of them hammering me with my failures as a father. So that was the beginning of day three. Um, as I say, Adam did not want to make this trip. <clears throat> he had done everything he could to avoid it. I ended up just buying the tickets, buying the gear, making all the arrangements, and using parental guilt uh, <laughs> to, to get him to come along. And at the beginning of the trip in particular, things changed to some extent as we moved down the river and encountered various obstacles and had to do things together. But in the beginning of the trip, he was impossible. He was absolutely impossible and was everything that you think about teenagers at their worst uh, to the second power. And um, I'm going to read a section here where we're floating and we're not catching any fish. And I'm really worried that I've brought him to a place where we're not going to catch any fish. Maybe an impossibility in Alaska, by the way. Dad, he said, you're bringing the rod back too far on your back cast. I adjusted my back cast. It had been a little sloppy for sure, and occasionally the line had caught the water behind me. I probably had played out more line than I could comfortably handle. I shortened the line by reeling some in, moved the rod through a tighter arc, and showed better control. A little farther downstream, Adam spoke again. Dad, you almost hit me with that fly. I was fishing with a weighted fly, which tends to drop on the forward cast. It had zipped by our ears a couple of times. A weighted fly that smacks the ear or side of the head is painful and not uncommon when fishing in the wind, so I snipped it off and replaced it with an unweighted pattern. It didn't fish as well, but it was safer. I went back to casting. You're not covering the water, Adam said. I tried harder. After a half mile more of river, Dad, you're missing the best runs. You've wasted all of the best water. I could see that his criticism wasn't going to stop until I had stopped fishing. And even then, Adam would probably find a new failing of mine. He hadn't liked the rowing either. It was to this or to that. I decided to overlook it. I was getting used to this by now. I knew it was my presence and not my fishing that was annoying him. Some of this has to be his age, I thought. At least I wanted some of it to be his age, a small piece of it. Did it all have to be my fault? I knew that the parents of teenagers are pitiful and hopeless in the eyes of their children. In the last year, at various times, Adam had advised me that I had bad breath, thinning hair, body odor, a protruding gut, and that I slouched and made too much noise when I ate. Of the two parents, fathers are especially disgusting to their children. They have patches of hair on their shoulders, and hair grows out of their ears and nose, and they eat onions and sardines, and their toenails grow brown and cracked. One morning, I had made the mistake of coming out of the bathroom after a shower in my underwear. Dad, that's gross. <laughs> Nothing was as vile to Adam as the sight of his father in his underwear. 
I had trained myself to chew slowly and quietly. I even swallowed with care. I had, Adam had watched me across the kitchen table, listening. Nobody eats as loud as you do, Dad. I don't even know how you do it. <laughs> I kept a supply of breath mints. I sucked in my stomach around him, and I never, ever went around in my underwear. As the parent of a teenager, I had learned to keep my capacity for being disgusting to a minimum, but there wasn't much I could do about my presence now. We were stuck with each other in the raft. Dad, you're splashing the line on the water. I took a deep breath. I figured it was time for us to take a break and to have some hot tea on the shore. As I say, <laughs> um, it got worse before it got better. Uh, as I say, as when I began the book, I didn't expect that it would pull me back as far as it did into my own childhood. And uh, fishing had always been important to me, but as I wrote the big book, I began to kind of fit it into a larger pattern of my life. And so I, as I wrote it, I thought, can I remember the first time I went fishing? And I, and I actually could. Um, and uh, it's a memory I've carried for a very long time, and it's, it's always been vivid in my mind. But when I wrote the book, I found that the memory of that really came back to me. Um, and I can still picture the little kid that I was at that particular time fishing really in the beginning. So this is um, the book, the, the second chapter opens, the second chapter is called Growing Up as a Fisherman, and it, it opens with a, an excerpt from a poem by Louise Gluck, uh, which reads, we look at the world once in childhood, the rest is memory. So this is a short uh, passage about that, you know, early fishing of mine. This is a memory behind all the other memories. A cold, clear brook flows between grassy banks and among tall trees, and I am standing in a place close to where the brook enters a river. My pant legs are rolled to my knees. The clear water of the brook mingles with the slow, muddy water of the river along a seam in front of where I am standing. I'm holding a fishing rod. It is summertime and the sun warms my face. I am nine years old. I am alone except for the trees and the birds. One bird is calling, a three-note song, pure and melodic. Conqueree! It teeters in a tree that leans over the brook. It is a red-winged blackbird, and I know its call so well that I assume that it is singing to me. Conqueree! Conqueree! I seem always to see only one red-winged blackbird at a time, so I have come to think of all red-winged blackbirds as one. Conqueree! The bird is my friend, so are the trees, the brook, and the green ferns bowing their tips into the water. I am familiar with each of them. My legs are icy cold, and I clench my teeth against the ache in my shins. I feel the stones and sand of the stream bottom pushing into the arch my arches and between my toes. I work my heels into the sand. Behind me, the brook comes down from a hill, and the cool breath of the woods touches my back in occasional puffs. I am at home and at ease. I sense the place where the two waters touch and mix, the clear water flowing into the muddy water, is trying to tell me something. I can't unlock the meaning, but the sensation of connection and companionship is so strong that even as I am experiencing it, I know it will always be important to me. I long for a way to express it, but having none, I flip a silver spinner into the wrinkle pushed up by the two currents. The spinner sinks, and right away I feel a tug at the end of my line. I have hooked a fish. Um, then I thought, well, um, I'm going to write about the first time I took Adam fishing, something about Adam as a fisherman. And as the book develops, there's a lot of sort of parallelism in the, in the writing. And um, my son had some of my good qualities and some of my bad qualities. And, um, but uh, this is a section about uh, Adam. <coughs> who, by the way, is in Peru right now, um, and uh, sent me a very beautiful note uh, about three weeks ago, which made the writing of the book worthwhile, that alone. Okay, from the beginning, when I first put a rod in his hands at age seven in a brook near our home in Maine, he had fished with intensity, but without aggression. 
<clears throat> it was a rare combination in a good fisherman. I had known lots of good fishermen. Many felt the need to land and kill every fish they hooked. Make sure I'm in the right place. Yes. <clears throat> Many had felt the need to land and kill every fish they hooked, and some weren't happy until they took every fish out of the stream. It was their aggression that gave them focus. They were fish killers. Adam's focus came from another place. I don't know that I had ever seen him happier than the day when he was about six years old that he discovered a nest of baby mice in the barn. He called me out to see them, full of wonder at their hairless pink bodies, each small enough to curl up on a dime. He watched them for an hour before I insisted that we cover them back up with duff and leave them alone for their mother. He had that same look each time he caught a fish. Another day he ran into the house as I was reading the newspaper, eager to show me what he had caught in the clover in the front yard. He thrust out his hand. I looked closely over my newspaper. Pinched between his thumb and middle finger was a fat bumblebee, furiously pumping and straining its stinger. Adam, I said slowly, don't let it go. Let's walk to the door, just hold it carefully. When I tell you to, and not a second before, throw it out as hard and as fast as you can. Then stand back because I'm going to slam the door. It was easy to turn Adam into a fisherman. I just put him near water. So that's, um, you know, that's the nice portrait of Adam. Um, but as I say, he could be impossible. We had... Um, I had, I shouldn't say he had, I had one really horrible night on the river. It was raining very hard, harder than usual, and the wind was blowing. And uh, after several days, the tent had begun to leak. And I had rented this, I was broke when I made this trip, and I had rented everything, done everything basically on the cheap. And I had arranged for the least expensive outfitter, the least expensive gear, the cheapest flight into the bush, I was cutting corners. So the tent finally began to give way, and in the middle of the night, uh, I felt the water coming in from the tent. Now, the tent was pitched on a slight incline. I was at the bottom of the incline in the tent, so when the water came in, it puddled under my sleeping bag, and I was in a Kmart, if you can believe this, cheap sleeping bag. One I had bought for the kids years ago when, you know, they were sleeping in the backyard on, you know, some sort of night out with their friends. And um, Adam, on the other hand, had a beautiful L.L. Bean, waterproof, uh, extra warm mummy bag. So he was high and dry, and I was in the tent soaking wet. And uh, this is the scene that unfolds on that particular night. So uh, once I've, you know, I've discovered that there's nothing much that I can do, I can't get dry, there's nowhere to go, I ask Adam if I can get into his sleeping bag. You know, I changed my clothes and I got dry. Um, and um, I'm looking for somewhere to sleep. Adam, I said, Adam. I was calling him from that far shore that he traveled to in sleep. What, he barked. He spoke without taking his head out of the bag. He was perturbed at having been woken up. The tent is leaking, my bag soaked. Yeah, so? He, wa he wasn't going to make this easy for me. I need to get into your sleeping bag with you. No way, Dad, he said. <laughs> he didn't move. Letting his father into his sleeping bag was an intimacy he wasn't going to allow. There was no way that he was going to let me with my father stink into his sleeping bag next to him. I had come to the wrong place for a favor. He didn't even pull his head out of the bag to gauge the extent of my predicament. I'm dressed and I'm dry. Come on, there's room enough for the two of us. Forget it. He burrowed into his bag, his first, first movement since I had awakened him, pulling the top tighter down on his head. This was his signal that he wanted the conversation to be over. I persisted. Adam, I'll be still, and we can both get some sleep. I've, I've got nowhere to sleep. No way, you're not getting into my bag, Dad. 
His voice was resolute, and I wasn't going to be able to plead my way into his bag. The only way into the bag was going to be by force. I would have to pull it open and fight my way in. This was one more expression of his unrelenting anger, and I felt powerless in the face of it. I was still capable of taking him in a fight if it came to that, and surely if I tried to shimmy into the bag, there, it would. There would be a wrestling match, and we would rip the bag and knock down the tent, and there would be blood and more anger. Had it really come to this? I sat back on my heels and tried to find some way that I could remain in the tent and sleep. Leaning against the wall of the tent was out of the question. The tent fabric would leak if I touched it, and it probably wouldn't support my weight anyway. Exasperated, I left the tent, taking the shotgun with me. If a bear wandered into camp, I didn't want to greet it unarmed. I put on dry socks, pulled on my waders, zipped my rain jacket to my chin, and lifted its storm hood over my head. I searched the sodden, land se land s the sodden seamed for a plan. It was too wet to build a fire. Could I tip the raft and use it as a shelter? No, it was too heavy to pull from the river by myself. There were no trees big enough to offer a canopy from the rain, and even if there had been, the rain was so steady and deliberate, the leaves and branches would have made a leaky umbrella. In, ra in waders and rain jacket, I basically was watertight, but I was tired and craved sleep. I walked around, checked the campsite, and saw a rock that I could lean against. The ground was flat. I sat down, sidled into place, and pulled the drawstring on my hood tight so that only my eyes were exposed to the weather. I might as well have been inside a Ziploc bag. I shivered and hunched my shoulders. The rain was hitting me from behind. I was cold and I was miserable. The trip had definitely hit its low point. I was sitting on the ground in the pouring rain, cold and aching for sleep. My son had refused me space in his sleeping bag. My sleeping bag probably would be wet for days. It would take hours of rare and precious sunlight to dry it. I had exhausted my stash of dry clothes. It had been raining off and on for days, and it probably would continue to rain until the end of the trip. I felt wet down to my soul. The trip was a mistake, I thought. My persistence in putting it together without enough money and without Adam's support had been an act of stupidity. I had been a fool to stick with it. For three years, I had been packing peanut butter sandwiches and counting my change in the morning to decide whether I could afford the bus to work. How did I expect to afford a trip to Alaska? I had been out of my mind to bring us here. It had been unrealistic from the start. It was just plain dumb. The, uh, the, the scariest part of the trip was a section of the river called the Braids. And as I mentioned, these Alaska rivers braid and um, turn into several channels, and uh, in it, the, the water speeds up through the braids because the channels are narrower. So you're moving at 10 or 15 knots, which is like more than 15 miles an hour. And maybe the river is 10 feet wide, and the bushes along the side have been pounded down by the bears. And the river is turning just like this, so you may come around a bend and surprise a bear, which is always a dangerous situation, which is why we were carrying a shotgun. And then in the spring, when the freshet occurs, it pulls up the trees and breaks off the branches and sticks them in the bottom of the stream, and they sweep upstream, you know, like spears. So there was a chance of us um, getting punctured as well. We got through the braids successfully, and um, it was a turning point for us. Uh, we had to work together to make that happen. Uh, we were thrown, you know, into sort of each other's, I won't say our arms, but uh, I had to rely on him and he had to rely on me. The trip, and that represented a kind of turning point in the trip. And uh, I found myself gaining confidence and there was something about the experience that was changing Adam's view of me as well. I was acting like a parent. I had taken control of the boat and of the situation and I was bringing, him through, bringing us both through this very dangerous uh, situation. And so the second part of the trip really was much more successful uh, than the first. And um, I'm going to read a sh short section of the braids here just to set up what it was like in the beginning of the braids. And then I'll conclude with a, uh, a short section. 
The first sign that something might be wrong appeared as we moved with the current, which was gaining speed from some large mid-river tributaries, and we saw that the river split ahead into channels, neither larger than the other, either one likely to be the main stem of the river. This struck me as odd since typically one channel is wider and deeper than the other and represents the true course of the river. Typically the smaller channel button hooks around an island in a loose loop and soon regains the main river. In that case, the worst that can come from making a wrong choice about which channel to travel is that the raft strikes a long stretch of shallow water and the rafters have to disembark and haul the raft back to the place where the river split again to regain the main stem. Some time is lost and the work is hard, but it's no big deal. So while the split ahead struck me as odd, I wasn't worried. Which way do you think we go, I called out to Adam. He looked up, right and left. Left, I think, he said. He waved his arm toward the left channel. Why left, I asked. What do you see to the left? Can you see anything? More water to the left, he said. I think there's more flow. Possibly he saw something I didn't. I was moving my eyes back and forth as the split loomed closer. I was about 300 yards off and we were moving fast. There was an island between two channels. From where I sat in the raft, I could see downstream far enough to determine the island's length. It seemed to swell to a width of several hundred feet, and it was choked with thick, short willows that came down and even into the water. The basket weave of limbs, branches, and leaves looked impenetrable. I wouldn't want to have to walk across it, let alone drag a raft over it. By now it was evening, around 9 o'clock, and the clouds had opened temporarily to admit some sunlight onto the river. It sparkled ahead of us. I examined the widths of the two river channels again as we drew closer, tried to discern their depths from the waves over submerged rocks, and peered down their, their lengths to see which reached further. I wasn't seeing anything that gave me a clue as to how to make the choice. They were mirror images. You think left, huh? I said to Adam and then and added, yeah, that looks like the way to go. I had no basis for affirming the left fork over the right. I was speaking what I hoped to be true. It was an unconscious and hopeful incantation, say it so to make it so. The words amounted to throwing some salt over my left shoulder. In the rowing position, which put my back downstream, I pulled hard on the left oar and, and the raft headed toward the downstream left bank. We slid over a lip of gravel and into the left channel. As we did, I noticed a bluff about a half mile back from the right side of the river. I guessed that it was an ancient glacial moraine, a massive pile of gravel washed from below a retreating glacier. Lichen and grasses now carpeted it. I held the sight of it as a landmark. It was something that would allow me to judge our direction and distance from the fork. Without it, if the clouds closed back on the sun, I would be completely disoriented. It was my only reference point. I watched it move farther and farther away as the river carried us down and away in a direction. I judged to be south. I didn't want us to be going south. I wanted us to be going west to the sea, but a southward loop wouldn't be alarming as long as we eventually regained a seaward direction, principally to the west. My stomach, stomach sank when I saw that just 100 feet down the braid, the river split again. The second fork hadn't been visible from the first. Oh, shit, I said to Adam. The wider channel, which was the logical choice for travel, turned farther to the south and to the left again. Should I take it, or should I gamble on my sense of direction, my growing attachment to my friend, the distant bluff? and choose the narrow right-hand channel and hope that it would put us on a more westerly course and back toward the channel we had departed from. I could still see the bluff hulking behind us and to the right. Its presence argued for choosing the narrower channel. What do you think, Dad? Adam said. He sensed some danger. I'm thinking this could turn into a major pain in the ass, I said. Let's get closer and have a look. The current was speeding up by virtue of the narrower channels, I, I guessed. There wouldn't be much time to make a decision. Once the raft got close to the fork, the downward force of the river pushed the raft in one direction or another, and it was nearly impossible to overcome the water's power with the oars. Let's go right, I said. It's now or over, but it seems to flow in the right direction. As we got closer, though, I could see that the narrower fork almost immediately tunneled into a wall of vegetation. It looked like a Florida mangrove. There would be no way we could float it. It was impossible. Impassable. Okay, change that, I said. We're going left again with the flow. I worked the left oar, bounced off the willows, and spun to the left. We flew down the second braid. I could no longer see the bluff. A bank of mist and clouds had moved in and closed off the view of it. The sun was gone, too. The braid we were on was narrow, and the willows along the banks reared up above us. I couldn't see over them. There was no horizon line. 
So this is what it felt like to be a woodchuck walking between tall hedges. I could look down into the river and up to the sky, but my vision to either side was blocked by the jungle of willow and alders. They rocked in the swift water. The sky darkened and it began to rain. We encountered one fork after another. They came on this fast. No sooner would we take one than it flowed back into the one that we had departed. Another braid would take us away from the general direction in which we had been moving and bring us back to another fork. Everything began to look the same, the vegetation, the river, each fork in the island. Well, we did find our way out. I'm here this evening. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to close with one short passage in which I um, describe uh, some of what I saw in Alaska. In the writing of the book, uh, and this was a surprise to me, um, the landscape of Alaska became a kind of gift that I could work with as a writer. Um, in many ways, it reinforced the story that I was trying to tell. And when I started the book, I didn't attach any special significance to the fact that we had gotten lost on the river. Um, you know, but as the story developed, I could see that you know, we were lost in more than one way. And so there are many places where the nature, the landscape in the book, really mattered a lot. And finally, with this, this last passage I'm going to read to you, um, I was, in a sense, sort of healing and mending uh, on this trip in a variety of different ways for, for lots of different reasons, um, gaining confidence as a father, uh, facing up to some things that had happened in my life. But I had always in my life derived um, power, energy, healing from nature. And I was feeling that in Alaska. And so this uh, last short passage uh, tries to describe some of that. <clears throat> I didn't feel a stranger in this landscape. I felt at home and that I belonged. It was that old and inexplicable companionship of trees, grass, and river. Among them I felt what others must feel in museums or churches. There was beauty in the shapes and patterns and color, a harmony that fitted all the pieces together into a natural divinity. The unspoiled and uncompromised landscape suggested to me the beginning of things, without judgment, yet quietly aware of my presence. The water floated my raft, the wood in the campfire warmed my hands, the hawks saluted by lifting off their perches in the trees as we passed by. There is a common strain in all of nature, I think, and the man who learns woodcraft in the Wisconsin woods will find that he has comrades on the African veldt, and the fisherman who throws his net from a reed boat in the Indian Ocean has a brother in the herring fishermen of New England. They are related by the life of the planet, its pulse and respiration, and the inexplicable magnificence of so many things working together to create an intricate system of miraculous and connected life. We who are fishermen are both witness and bit players in that marvelous poem that is the natural world. So I'll end there. And uh, thank you. And if you have some questions, I'd be, be happy to take them. Yes, here and then we'll go to Carla. Yes. How did you decide on Alaska initially? Like, did you have a sense of how dangerous it was, or was it sort of like just a fantasy, or how did right. Alaska? It was a kind of fantasy. When I was a boy, I read a lot of outdoor magazines. I lived in the city. Uh, I taught myself to fly fish between these narrow garden apartment buildings. There wasn't a trout for miles. But I was out there in my fishing vest, you know, and doing this. And so I would read about Alaska. And, it, you know, it always, it was the place to go. In um, 1994, 95, I was on a fellowship, and I brought Adam with me. And uh, we were tying flies and talking about what we were going to do. And, and I suggested that when he graduated from high school, we would go to Alaska. And I made this as a promise. Um, so it was something that kind of echoed from my own childhood, but it was really a promise that I had made to Adam, and that promise came back to me um, when he was going off to college. I thought, goodness, he's mad, he's leaving, I'll never see him again, and so I sort of retrieved this idea of Alaska. I didn't realize how dangerous it would be. I did all of my research on the Internet. I made some telephone calls. I had seen pictures of the braids, but they sure didn't look very dangerous in the pictures I had seen. I had definitely underestimated the danger of the trip. Carla. Two questions. One, did you guys eat fish every night? The other thing that I did wrong was not bring enough food. Um, 
I brought a lot of food, but after about four days, we were almost out of food. We were eating huge rations of food. It was cold, um, and each time we stopped, we wanted to eat. You know, we'd eat, I'd have to boil a pound of spaghetti four times a day. I mean, that's how much food we were eating, and I was losing weight uh, along the way. So uh, we had planned to eat fish, but after day four, it became a necessity. And fortunately, the fish in Alaska is just delicious. I mean, we would catch one big char. I found the char to be the best fish. It's very oily and delicious and fresh. And I would charcoal the char over the fire. And, you know, we'd eat a couple of pounds of fish each, you know, each night. So we ate a lot of fish. And uh, I came, I'm probably 190 pounds right now. I came back from that trip. I was about 168 pounds and in great shape. I need to go again. <laughs> so second question, which is not in the book, I'm sure, is how, what was Adam's response to the book? Good question. Um, as I was writing the book, uh, very close to being done, I gave him the manuscript. In fact, I guess I was done. I gave him the full manuscript. And I said, Adam, you know, you really need to read this, and let's talk about it. You know, I didn't want him to not be comfortable with it. And, and you know, there's a lot. Neither of us look so great in this book, by the way. You know, so, so he went somewhere and he came back and I said, well, you know, what do you think of the book? And he said, he said, well, Dad, it's not the book I would have written. <laughs> Typical, you know, Adam understatement. But it's your book, so, you know, great. So I thought, okay, well, this is pretty good. And so then, the, you know, the book went off to the publisher a year, year and a half passes, and then the published version comes back and just coincidentally, Adam comes home from Peru. He came back to raise some money for earthquake victims about a month and a half ago. And I said, Adam, here it is. You know, here's your copy. I gave him a signed copy. So he sits down on the sofa and he starts reading it and he says, you know, I probably should have read it the first time. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I just kind of blew through it, Adam, Dad. I wasn't really, you know, in the mood to read the book. <laughs> so I said, well, yeah, maybe you better read it this time, Adam. So he did read it. and. Um, he um, didn't say much initially. He was, had his nose in the book for several days. He went away, and then I got a, just a lovely, beautiful note from him, an email about the book and about the trip, and so he's good with the book. Yeah. Yes? Well, did, you take, did you take notes? You didn't take notes during. I did. I had a journal. I took a journal, and I, you know, when I was on the trip, I wasn't planning to write a book. You know, I'm just a... When I go out, I'm a journal keeper, and the, you know, and I put flowers and insects, and you know, press them and all of that. So um, I was keeping a journal, but mostly it was four trout today, six salmon, uh, river swifter, you know, just sort of basic facts. But interestingly, um, something must have been going on because. BU Today recently did a s little slideshow about this, and they were asking for pictures and materials. So I went back and I pulled out all the pictures, and I found the journal that I kept, and I gave it to them. I said, "Yeah, maybe you want a picture of a waterlogged journal for the thing." And I read the through the journal, and the uh, I had I must have awakened on that third day and written the opening of the book. It's in the journal almost exactly as it is in the book, and I had I wasn't conscious at the time that I was doing that. I just felt a need to unburden myself of whatever I was <coughs> feeling and seeing at the time. So, um, you know, the idea of the book came later. Sarah suggested I should write a book. And I said, why? It's just a fishing trip, <laughs> you know. Um, but I did keep a journal, yes. And I had pictures, too, though I did drop the camera in the water, so not that many pictures. <laughs> and so when you got back, so you had your journal, then how soon after you got back did you start writing something? Um, three years. Oh, right. I didn't really think I was going to make it a book. Maybe two and a half years. I think that's right. Is that right? I tend to get things wrong sometimes. Is that right? It's about two and a half years? Yeah, about two and a half or three years. And um, the hard part, Amy, you're a writer, so I mean, you understand this for me was getting the voice of the book right. And, you know, I spent the first the whole summer writing the first 15 pages over and over and over again, tuning the voice. You know, I, you know, we're all made up of many different voices, 
and I wanted to I wanted you know, I wanted the reader to like the narrator and I wanted it to him to come off as somebody who honestly had been through something difficult but was hopeful you know sort of beat up but hopeful that was you know, the position I wanted to take in the world and so once I got the voice of the book right then it was just a matter of kind of working my way through it and do you think that 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 stretch of time the two and a half to three years did that help you in the sense that you could look back and see it as a I think so because I think when I first got back I was too close to it you know and you, it has to I don't know rise a little bit something has to happen where it goes from experience to recollection when you got back, you were just happy to be alive. completely right yeah no I, and I felt great when I got back I really felt terrific um, but I think the waiting helped right and then after that it took about I would say a year and a half to two years of concentrated writing time over three years to write it, I couldn't, couldn't go right at it all the time. <coughs> yes? Is it a trick question? It's obviously the question of somebody who doesn't have kids, but when I was listening to this again, when you were outside the tent and Adam wouldn't let you into his sleeping bag, what were your feelings toward him? I felt that I didn't deserve to be in that sleeping bag and that I was completely empathic with him and um, you know it's this is an interest people have completely different responses to this sleeping bag scene some people think what were you out of your mind just get in the sleeping bag you're the father he's the son and you're it's miserable but uh, I didn't think that way for whatever reason um, you know I felt that I had to ask to be admitted and when rejected I thought well he's within his right to do this and you know I better go outside and sleep in the rain. So you never like had a flash of hatred for him? No. Never. No. Not once. No. How do others feel? How many people would get in the sleeping bag? I kind of hate him. <laughs> <laughs> How many people would not get in the sleeping Everybody bag? Does. No, yeah. I don't have to. I'm <laughs> serious. Yeah. I, would, I would not have been, but I wasn't serious. I was feeling sorry for myself. I, I, you know, I wasn't being noble. I mean, I was feeling sorry for myself, definitely. You know, this is horrible. Look what you I'm going through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I think now, of course, you know, you always hypothesize it could be different, but I think in those kind of situations happen with my kids, I think where I go is then I start, I start to feel like, what is, like, disappointed in the relationship, like instead yes, of right. sort of how do I have a child where I'm their parent that they're sort of not seeing my this right. sort of in the global way I think of right. people whose kids care, you know, in other that's cultures, a, I would sort of go in like how did this happen that we're right. I, and I, you know, you're, you that's really interesting and, and I, I think maybe you're opening up more about what I felt than I'm even saying I think you're right I think if there was any disappointment it was in me for having raised a son who wouldn't let me in the sleeping bag like where did I go wrong here didn't I teach him this lesson somewhere you know you're supposed to take care of your family and you, you know this is and so it wasn't direct the anger wasn't directed at him it was sort of again back to me and where did the relationship go off that's a that's a very good insight. I think a lot of parents do that. Did he ever mention it later on? Does he ever mention it that scene? Uh, I think we did talk about it, and for him, it's like, well, what did you expect? You wanted to get my sleeping bag? What are you crazy? You know, <laughs> you know, no way. <laughs> Still. Oh yeah, absolutely. And he's studying to be a priest, by the way. Oh, <laughs> you know? wow. Yeah. So, you know, I. <laughs> so I, I guess you know. Some of those values stop at the parental line. <laughs> yes, Sephora. What you would have done if you had actually faced a bear? We did face a bear, and I, I, I won't read the section because it's kind of long. No. Um, we came around a bend, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a bear nine feet tall, which is, this is about a nine-foot ceiling in here, so that gives you a sense of the size of the bear. She was about 1,000 pounds, and she had with her a cub. So while bears almost always run away, if you surprise them with a cub, it's the guaranteed exception to bears will leave you alone if you leave them alone. We were 
only 40 yards away, which is, you know, you can think it's this, the whole scene took place in something the size of a tennis court, just to kind of give you a sense of space. And uh, we couldn't go past the bear because the river was too narrow. She would have just reached out and clawed the, and, you know, so I had to pull the raft over maybe 30 yards from where she is. And a bear can cover 30 yards in seconds. They're faster than Olympic sprinters, despite their size. We stepped out of the raft. I had a shotgun. You're always advised to carry a shotgun, you know, some weapon in Alaska when you're alone because the bears can be occasionally be dangerous. And so it was a shotgun with slugs. It was a per very powerful gun. But still, it's a big animal. It's like shooting a rhino or something, you know. You can shoot them and they can still come at you. We stepped out of the raft and um, when we crunched the gravel, she looked up. And she looked at Adam, and she foc She stayed with him like it was like a heat-seeking missile or something. She's just locked on Adam. And he got nervous. And he started to walk away, and then he started to jog away. And it triggered, and this is very typical, a kind of predatory response in the bear. So she went down on all fours and did two or three of these, you know, running at him. So I brought the gun up and put it on the bear, and um, I thought, I may have to shoot this bear. And if I do, I don't think I can kill her. And even if I do kill her, she's going to land on top of me. I mean, we, this is how close it was at this point. And then what do I do? You know, I've got to push a dead bear off, and what if she's not? You know, I mean, it was, it was really horrible. So I'm shouting, as I have the gun up and the bead on the bear, I'm shouting to Adam to stop. Finally, he stopped. And at this point, she's maybe 20 yards, 15 yards from Adam. And she stopped, and at that point, she looked back to look at her cub. And again, this is where nature is kind of a gift in the writing of the book. I'm worried about my cub. She's worried about her cub. Mm -hmm. She looks back, and uh, her cub is gone. It had went up onto the bank and into the bushes. So now she's indecisive. Looks back to Adam, looks back to her cub, a couple of those, and then she Motherhood prevailed, thank God. And so she went back and she went looking for her cub and we got in that raft and we were out of there. And after that we were, you know, banging pots and singing and whatever, you know, so that we didn't frighten any more bears. But it's quite exciting to encounter a bear. And, you know, and they're very big, they're not only big presences, you can't believe how large they are, but they, you can hear them breathing you know, it's like whale sounds, you know, like organ sounds, you know, in their lungs and in their trachea. And you can smell them. They smell like wet dogs um, that have been rolling in fish, you know. So you're very, in, in fact, if a bear has departed, you can still smell it. So it's really quite an experience. I don't want to repeat it, but it was quite an experience. No, no, no. It's, once, we were, once it was gone, it was gone. Thank God. But the bears were definitely not the scariest part of the trip. It was everything else that was happening. You know, sort of the other bears in my life that were frightening. Yes? Did your son also fear for his life? I mean, did you have sort of moments where you really thought this might be it? Yeah, twice. When the bear was chasing him, that was bad. And I knew that he knew if the bear actually caught him that he should roll himself up in a ball and play dead because typically a bear will just swat you around and you'll get, you know, cut up but you won't get killed. I knew he knew that but he also knew not to run so I was worried that he wouldn't do it. So that was a very fearful thing. But the scariest physical part of the trip were the, were the braids. I mean it was dark, it's raining, I don't know where we are. We're going west, uh, going south rather than west. These sweepers are doing this in the river. Uh, we could be another bear encounter, and I, you know it was really bad. And so what I tried to do was just project confidence, be a father, you know. I and I wasn't really strong enough. I mean, I guess you get to be in your 40s. I was 49 at the time, and your your life is sort of not on the. <laughs> you're going down rather than up, and I couldn't control the raft. So, um, and again, this, I think, had certain implications in the relationship. I said, Adam, you row. I, I can't row the raft. I'm just not strong enough to row the raft. And he's a six and a half feet tall, and he's a big strapping kid and an athlete. He was great at the raft. 
I was much better at standing in the front of the raft and spotting the danger and giving the directions. So I gave the directions and he executed the oars and we got out of there. But that was the, that was the scariest part. Well, thanks for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. It's been fun. <laughs>